it's not advancing. Right. Yeah. Wait a minute, maybe it is. Just wait a second. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's gonna be like a couple right. second delay. Yeah, so it might be a little bit of delay between. Okay, the now the question is, can people hear me? Okay. No, you guys. <laughs> you guys can? Um, we're having trouble with uh, Wi-Fi. Oh, that's you. What? There's a where it says start video. There, it's like a dead bottom. Does that mean anything? Just test one, two, three. Can you hear us? Can you folks hear us at home? Well, why don't we just proceed yeah. like yeah. they are? Because we can see that yeah. my voice is picking yeah. up here. So, um, hold on. I'm going to try and unmute this one and see if they can. If we can get that. Can people hear us now? I think so. <laughs> Okay, hold on. No, it should be all right. Let's just get out of that for a minute. I'm just going to go with it. Okay, they can hear us. We can hear you. Okay. Let's just see what's happening. Okay, so, so we're, we're going to take that trip. Oh, we, we can't have we can't have both of them on. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hopefully, folks can still hear me. All right, we're going to take a trip down to Antarctica. So on the bottom of our planet is a really large continent. It's about one and a half times um, the size of the United States. The lower forty-eight. It's broken up into what's called East and West Antarctica. There's the Trans-Antarctic Mountains that, that split through there. Um, and the Ross Sea region down here, uh, this is the side of Antarctica that supports New Zealand and Australia. South America is off the Antarctic Peninsula and Africa is uh, just uh, straight up north. But we're gonna, we're gonna take a trip down here to uh, the, uh, the Ross Sea. So, I'll tell you a little about um, my background. I'll talk about scientific ocean drilling and how scientific how drilling into the seafloor since 1968 has allowed us to learn a tremendous amount about our planet's history. I'll talk a little about uh, marine sediments, but mainly as uh, related to microfossils. We'll talk about this IODP, this Interna um, International Ocean Discovery Expedition. 374, which I was on uh, five years ago. And then at the end, you know, sort of why it matters. So 2018 was not the first time I was in Antarctica. Uh, when I was an undergraduate um, at Northern Illinois University, my advisor um, was very active in Antarctic research. And I started working in his lab, his micropaleontology lab, when I was an undergrad. I went to Antarctica three times. Um, my very first time, that picture in the upper left is in 1976, and we were tent bound for two and a half days um, with these really strong catabatic winds. Um, as a matter of fact, this is the, the, the campus newspaper uh, that came out in January 77 about braving this blizzard. And my face down here, that's a combination of sun and wind is where that um all that came from and the picture is flying over east antarctica uh, where the east antarctic ice sheet is coming through the trans antarctic mountains and then 2018 i was on an international expedition i was about 30 scientists uh on board this ship um and we spent almost two months down in antarctica um studying all kinds of aspects about about um, the Ross Sea. Now, we were on a drilling vessel 
called the Joides Resolution, which is the ship um, at the bottom here. But the international community has been drilling in the deep sea since 1968, beginning with this, uh, what was called the Deep Sea Drilling Project, which ended in 1983. When I was a first year PhD student at the University of Colorado, I sailed on the Glomar Challenger, the one in the upper left, uh, which was really a, a great experience. Um, that ship is doesn't have a fraction of the capacity that the new program has. But we, like I said, we've learned a lot about our, our planet's history, um, especially like the last 200 million years of, of Earth history from drilling into the um, into the seafloor, which just in general we call scientific ocean drilling. So these are the um, seven expeditions that I've gone on. Expeditions are typically two months. And uh, the first one that I was on, uh, the Global Challenger was here off Northwest Africa. And the most recent was, was down here in, uh, in Antarctica. And a number of my graduate students have participated um, in this program over the years, which has been really exciting. Okay, so I'm a micropaleontologist, means I study microfossils, and I specifically study a group of critters called uh, foraminifera. Foraminifera are sand-sized protists, so they're single cell. Um, they have multiple chambers, um, but I'm going to pass around a jar here. This is um, all what looks like sand in here, white sand, those are all microfossils of, of this group. Now, the, the great thing about forams, in uh, the sort of common name, we call them forams instead of foraminifera. The ones on the left are, are planktonic, so they float in the upper water column. The ones on the right are on the, on the seafloor. The beauty is, is out in the ocean, we got these critters upstairs and we got critters downstairs. After these ones die or they're eaten and turn into fecal pellets, they settle to the seafloor. So geologists come along, you know, years later, we take a sample of the seafloor, we get both. So we can study the surface ocean and we can study the deep ocean using these, these organisms. And they're really very powerful because they're sand-sized microfossils. We use reflected light, uh, micro microscopy, and after I uh, wash a sediment over a sieve, what I do is I wash away the silt and clay size fraction, and I'm left with the sand size fraction. And that's where these microfossils are. And what I do is I sprinkle the dry sediment on this picking tray. And then at the microscope, I, I'll, I use a fine brush and I can, I can pick and manipulate these microfossils, you know, identify the species or what have you. Um, so they're, they're, um, <clears throat> they're pretty easy to um, manipulate. The thing is, uh, foraminifera live in all kinds of marine environments, at the surface and at the seafloor, and from uh, salt marshes and estuaries all the way to the deepest parts of the ocean. So we, we can use them um, to, to reconstruct environments all through geologic time. Um, my work is, is focused in like the last 120 million years. Um, but th they're really useful for telling us about sea level, about all kinds of aspects about environment. And like I said, we've got um, the, the ones that live in the surface ocean and the ones that live in the seafloor. Now, the other thing that's really important about these things um, that, we, that we saw in the river is they're made out of calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is the same stuff that makes up a clamshell or a gastropod, a snake. So calcium carbonate, um, we, can, we can dissolve calcium carbonate. And if you put acid on limestone or on calcium carbonate, uh, it dissolves and it liberates CO2. And CO2, we can put in a mass spectrometer and then we can measure the stabilized scopes of carbon. It's not carbon-14, carbon-12 and carbon-13 and the stabilized scopes of oxygen. And it turns out on this plot of temperature versus depth, um, temperature, we can use uh, the ratio of the stable isotopes of oxygen to tell us about temperature and the stable 
isotopes of carbon to tell us about uh, the carbon cycle and gradients in the in the world ocean. So the, the takeaway is we can study them as organisms, as communities, as biota, but we can also study their geochemistry. And that's that's what I want to I want to show you an example um, of how we've been using their shells of these sand-sized microfossils to reconstruct uh, global climate change for a long time. So here, this little cartoon at the bottom here illustrates this, is that we've got the critters living at the surface and the ones living on the seafloor. And what happens over time is they just accumulate in the sediments, right? Older at the bottom and younger at the top, this is the seafloor. And this and a, and a marine uh, sample has both planktics and, and benthics in it. And um, we can also use those things to tell us about just how the how the um, the coupling that goes on between uh, the surface ocean and the deep ocean occurs. We won't get into that. Now, this is a diagram that we're going to have to take a minute to to think about. Oh no! Don't do this. It saw too much data. It freaked out. There's a what? I was I was looking for mine. I thought I had it in my bag, and I. Oh, perfect! Awesome. Okay, so you guys, this this is going to look a little busy, but I'll break it down for you real quick. Um, so this is the last, since the extinction of the dinosaurs, 66 million years ago, right here. So 66 million to today, right? Here's today up here, end of the dinosaurs down here. We've got stable isotopes of oxygen, which is uh, oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, and stable isotopes of carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13. We're gonna focus not on, on, the, on the carbon here for a second, but just, this, this curve right here, this shows oxygen values. And if you look at, there's a scale right here. When the values are over on this side of the scale, what that's telling us about climate is that it was warmer or there was less ice on the planet, less Antarctica, less Greenland, whatever. Over on the right hand side, so any data that comes over here to the left indicates um, colder or more ice through time. Now, one of the takeaway messages in, in here is this curve is not just um, a sloping line. It wasn't warm during the time of the dinosaurs and getting cold towards today. It's, it's, there's a lot of change in there. Sometimes the change is kind of gradual when you see the sloping line, and sometimes the change is really fast, like right here. This point 34 million years ago is when Antarctica glaciated for the first time. 34 million years ago. And it happened probably within 200,000 years. Super fast, grew a really big ice sheet. And, and we can tell that because how rapidly this shift is, right? And then it was kind of stable and there's some, a lot of wiggles in here. And then in the latter part of the record right here, the last 2.6 million years, the Northern hemisphere finally glaciated, right? So the South Pole was glaciated 34 million years ago. It wasn't until like 2.6 million that the Northern Hemisphere grew big ice, right? And that's why the, the curve gets more and more um, positive over here towards these numbers. All this, all this big data in here, that's Northern Hemisphere glaciation. And the other thing, the reason why there's a lot of dots that span a big area is it goes from interglacial times like today versus glacial times like 20,000 years ago. You know, right where we are right here, we were covered by a thousand feet of ice, right? Just 20,000 years ago. So there, there are these big glacial, interglacial cycles, which I'll talk about here in a second. So the thing is, we've got we've got lots of evidence from the deep sea that shows that there's changes through time. I want to point out one thing right here is called the um, middle Miocene climatic optima, right in here from about 17 to 14 million years ago. So this was a very unusual warm period 
But then it's also a warm period right here, just three million years ago. going on today, right? Global. All this. Ah. I think the internet But those are the at the last five the file key I've got some happen um in a minute there's it's not just four Carbon, carbon cells would that imply that they these are within the animal kingdom? Uh, no, because they're protists, uh, they belong to a different, um, they, they're what are called protoctisa. So they're not animals, they're animal like. Now, I'll say something about that in just a second. So here's two sites the blue side and the, and the, and the brown, all those are individual samples from about 35 million years ago up to 31. And what you can see in this record is there's this two-step, very rapid change, and the values are going to more positive numbers. This is, this is when Antarctica glaciated for the first time. Super fast. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's much lower than human time scales, but geologically, for this to, uh, for this to happen in um, you know, one or 200,000 years is crazy. And my, my colleague, Rob DeCanto, who's a climate modeler, uh, published a now very famous paper with his colleague showing, this is showing Antarctica and the, the growth of that ice sheet that happened really, really quick. So what Rob did is he took data from the deep sea and he ran a climate model and, and when it was able to replicate this two-step change that happened, um, 
And oh, the interesting thing about it is what triggered it, what triggered it was falling CO2. So if you think about, we had a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere in the past, much more than we have today. But um, various processes were drawing down carbon out of the atmosphere. And so CO2 in the atmosphere was falling and it reached a critical threshold, what we call a tipping point, and Antarctica glaciated just like that. Tipping points are really, really important. And this is one of the most important things that comes out of studying um, climate change in the geologic record is because we go to school on how these processes, it's, it's, rarely, it's rarely Darwinian and very slow and gradual and continuous. Rather, what happens in the climate system is that you can, you can push, push, push on the, on the climate system and it changes really, really fast. This is this whole concept of a tipping point. And what's shown here is, is just showing the CO2 business that, so here's 50 million years ago to the present, right? And this is CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And this is big drop in CO2 at about 34 million years ago. And that's when the Antarctic glaciate. It reached a certain point. Now, I've added these arrows on right here. That's today. This is during our last glacial maximum. And this was during the last interglacial, right? Pre-industrial. Pre the time that humans have been burned fossil fuels. So glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial. Here we are today. And right now, we're on track to reach 800 parts per million by the end of the century. That value, by the way, is very close to this, uh, to this threshold. So if you, if you draw down CO2, you can grow ice. But if you raise CO2, you can also melt it. And so that 800 is a very scary number right there. But that's right now what we're on, on, on track for. Mm. So the other thing I wanted to show you, a blow up of this curve is the last 5 million years. So that, that big data curve I showed you, all the isotope data were put like this, you know, from um, 70 million all the way to the present. I've just tipped it on the side here from uh, five and a half million to the present. But this, these, th this wiggle right here is the same thing. This is from benthic, deep sea benthic forming in front, the oxygen isotopes, the stable oxygen isotopes. And you can see that, and these are, these kind of data are what are called proxy data. They're indirect evidence of changes in the climate system. And geoscientists are detectives. We have to, use, we don't just use one kind of data. You, people are contributing data in all different types to try to piece together uh, how things happen. And, but they're called proxy data because they're indirect evidence of temperature and ice fog. But what we can see is back in the Pliocene, back in the Pliocene right here, notice, so this dashed line is today. That's the equivalent in the deep sea today of the values of deep sea benthic foraminiferous dash, dash line. Back in Pliocene time, it was warmer than today. And I also want to point out that the, that the climate signal here is very weak. It, it, there's, there's not much variability. But beginning about 2.6 million years ago, what, beginning of the Pleistocene, you notice that the amplitude increases and the numbers are starting to go towards more positive values down here. This is cold and more ice. So warm in the Pliocene, we're, we're heading towards the present day right here. And there's a 41,000 year beat to this, to, to this pattern right here. That 41,000 years has to do with the tilt of our Earth's axis. Right today, you know what our axial tilt is today? 20, 23 and a half. So 23 and a half. So when we go around the sun, we always keep this 23 and a half degrees. But sometimes in the past, it's been a little shallower. Sometimes it's been a little steeper. And it varies on 41,000 years. And the, the, the glacial, interglacial cycles of the early part of the Pleistocene were paced by this obliquity. And until about um, 800,000 years ago, um, then all of a sudden, Look at the amplitude of the glacial and interglacial cycles right here. They got really, really big. We grew really big ice sheets 
like the one that covered us. This was our last, this was our last glacial maximum right there. That was 20,000 years ago. So these are all glacial times and these are interglacial. So here we are today, our previous interglacial, et cetera. So there's, there's been in the last five, five and a half million years, there's been a lot of change. And hmm, the onset of Northern hemisphere glaciation was right back here about 2.6 or 2.7 million years ago. So warm Pliocene, by the way, the Pliocene was the last time we had 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Do we, do we know why it switched from that 41 million year cycle to 100 year? No, it's, it's still, it's called the mid Pleistocene transition. And we still don't fully understand why it switched from a 41,000 year world to 100,000 year world. We're still trying to figure out, people have some, there's some hypotheses about it, but anyway, the ice sheets got really, really big. And I'll show you an example of that actually right now. If, if I quit screwing up. Um, so here's that, here's that same five and a half million year record right here. And this is just somebody's uh, annotated it a little bit differently. So here's the Pliocene. And Pliocene warmth. This is the last time we were at 400 parts per million. And right now, a lot of climate scientists are focused on the Pliocene because it wasn't so long ago, three million years, three and a half, not so long ago. A little bit easier to understand, but we want to know, understand how Antarctica responded to the Pliocene warmth. And East Antarctica, you know, isn't is the issue, it's West Antarctica. That's the issue. I'll, I'll explain more about that a little bit later. And then during the Pleistocene, we had certain times that, are, that are, we refer to as super interglacials. These things that I've highlighted in red. A super interglacial was, it was warmer than most interglacials, including Antarctica. And we've got evidence that big uh, parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet disappeared. What we don't know, including the last, um, the last, Interglacial, um, the last interglacial, um, which is called Marine Ice Scope Stage Five, is that peak right there. We don't know how much of Antarctica melted or how much of Greenland melted, but just um, 125,000 years ago, sea level was six to nine meters higher. So six times three is 18, nine times three. So this is almost 30 feet higher than it is today. That's significantly high, just our last day of glacier. And so this is why we went to Antarctica to drill, was to try to go closer to the source, like to Antarctica, to see what was going on. So in the world today, we have ice sheets, we have bipolar ice. So Greenland up here, the rest of the white, that's sea ice. But Greenland has an ice sheet on it. Antarctica has an ice sheet. Plus, it has sea ice around it. But this is 20,000 years ago. This is the last, what's called the last glacial maximum. And you can see where we live up here in the Northeast, we had what's called the Laurentide ice sheet. The Greenland ice sheet was bigger. Um, parts of uh, Europe were covered, parts of Siberia. Um, mountain chains around the world had much more ice, and then our ice sheet was, was bigger. So we, we basically, on glacial, interglacial timescales, went from these two views, right? And down in Antarctica, so this is looking at the Ross Sea of Antarctica, and this is today. There's a, um, this area over here is, is called the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. In that very first slide I showed you, flying from New Zealand, I showed you these pictures flying over this part of Antarctica with those, with those big um, glaciers down here. This is West Antarctica over here. This is the part of Antarctica that is very vulnerable to global warming today. And today in the, in the Ross Sea, we have, this is a floating ice shell called the Ross Ice Shell. It's about the size of Texas or the size of France. One big slab of ice. But the thing is, these ice shells are really important because they buttress, they hold back all the ice streams from East and West Antarctica. They keep it in check. 
If the ice shelves start to go away, then you, you take away the buttressing and uh, the, the land-based ice, it's, it's runaway. That's, that's one of the, it's a huge concern. So that's today, this was 20,000 years ago, the ice sheets advanced all the way up across the, across the continental shelf. So think about this, just in, in, the, in the most recent millions of years, the ice sheets have been going back and forth across the ice shelf, or sorry, the continental shelf. And this is where we were drilling. This area right here, and I'll show you on the map in a second. It's this area right here. has been covered with ice uh, multiple times. Okay, now, while we're on the, just thinking about the glacial interglacial cycles for a second. This is an ice core record from Antarctica, from Vostok. It's so high up on the East Antarctic um, Plateau. And we've got, we've got two things shown here. The top plot is temperature. It's, it's the stable isotopes of oxygen, right? Back to 400,000 years ago. So here's today, this is an ice core record record that goes back a little over 400,000 years ago. And then within the ice, when it snows, and then the snow is compressed to form what's called fern, and then fern eventually gets compressed to form ice, it traps air. And those air bubbles contain a sampling of our atmosphere through time. This is CO2 in the atmosphere. Right, so here's today. And so some, some questions we could look at here. So two things, what's the natural range of variability of CO2 in the atmosphere before humans had any impact? So here's the record of CO2 in the atmosphere. And, and by the way, um, um, in, in the context here, so here's our last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. Here's today interglacial. Here's our previous interglacial, about 125, the glacial before it, interglacial, glacial, interglacial. See it back and forth. You can see that there seems to be a periodicity to this ice, right? There's a it's sawtooth pattern, but it's there's a pretty distinctive periodicity. So if you look through here, we got one, two, three, four glacials, you know, in 400,000 years. This is this 100,000 year world right here. But but the but the in, in my my classes we consider this. So what's the natural range of variability of CO two in the atmosphere before you? Uh, yeah, so about maybe close to one eighty during glacial times. See, this is a glacial time about one eighty. Interglacials up around like two eighty. 280, 180, 280, 180, 280, 180. Natural range of variability, CO2 in the atmosphere. Before humans, there was enough of us around to, to have an impact. So this is, this is a really important number to remember, this 180 to 280. Right? We've, every ice core that's been taken shows the exact same thing preserved in the ice, whether it's from Greenland or Antarctica or high up in the high up in some mountain cap. But here's, here's a, uh, an ice core coming out of Greenland instead of Antarctica, but you can see the gas bubbles in it. And that's, that's what gives us this, um, the record of, of CO2 in the past, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's really a fantastic um, um, record of this change. Okay, all right, I'd said, you know, because this talk was about Antarctica, it was about how we were gonna use microfossils, um, a real quick, a quick something about microfossils. So um, the ones that I study, hopefully you recognize are in the upper right here, right? These are the foraminifera. Um, these are calcium carbonate. There's some other even tinier fossils called calcareous nanofossils. And these are, these are super fine. Um, and then there's silicious ones that make their shells out of silica. There's diatoms and there's what are called radiolarians. So 4Ams and radiolarians are heterotrophs. They're like us. They require food to eat, right? They can't make their own food. We have to consume food. Calcareous nanoplankton and diatoms on the other hand 
are primary producers, just like grass and trees, right? They take sunlight and they capture sunlight with uh, chlorophyll and they make organic matter. They take inorganic CO2 and they make complex organic molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats that you and I depend on. So there's autotrophs on the left and heterotrophs on the, on the, on the right. And uh, <clears throat> these things all, these are parts, right? Just like the, the little microfossils I've got here, the forenames, the ones in the upper right. But rats, dotons, and, and hunters, and plankton, also those are hard parts. And so what happens is they accumulate on the, on the seafloor. And if, you, if you, maybe you've never even thought out there in the world ocean, what in the world is on the seafloor? It's really not that complicated. It's not very diverse about what's on the seafloor. There's what's called calcareous ooze and siliceous ooze. And the reason why I put an asterisk on there, these are biogenic sediments. They're made entirely out of the shells of plankton that are raining down from above. Then we have red clay and mud and sand in, in other places. So if we look at the world right here and the world ocean, you'll see that um, there's two kinds of biogenic sediments right here. The brick pattern, uh, the calcareous ones, so this would be like the four minute for the nice study, mostly concentrated in the low latitudes. And then this, uh, the ones that are made out of silica, like around Antarctica, near the equator, or up in the high latitudes. So most of, this, most of the ocean is covered with mud and biogenic stuff. The, the plankton are the sediments. Any of you seen White Cliffs of Dover before? Have you been there and seen it in person? The four minute form would be sanitized. I study foreign M's and comes um Calcium carbonate. Any ones and the round ones are all, they're all. Um, where there's a lot One here is chlorophyll.
this area around Antarctica. You see the, the red, there's a lot of chlorophyll, a lot. Journey, so from, from right, up, right up here, across the Southern Ocean, um, down, and th these are the sites that we drilled at in Antarctica. When I went to Antarctica as an undergraduate and a graduate student, master's student, this is the part of Antarctica that I worked on. Uh, um, some on the continent, but also a drilling project way down here on the Ross ice shelf. This is that area. This is the floating ice shelf right here that's about the size of Texas. <clears throat> and again, to... so, so that's New Zealand, that's Tasmania. And Australia. Okay, so I I, I told you I, I had to throw in some nature, right? So, you know what? One of the most fascinating birds every time I've been to sea, almost always we see albatross. And what's amazing about these birds have these massively wide wings, and they can soar. You never see them flap their wings. They totally glide, and they how they miss not getting taken out by like waves. I have no idea, but they're just like skimming right over the top. Um, they're really beautiful birds to to watch. And as we got closer to Antarctica, then we started seeing petrels, and I got a couple pictures of petrels. It's looking a little blurry. I thought this was really cool because the water was really calm and and got this reflection of the bird with the, with the water. So sometimes we had nice calm seas, but other times um, um, it wasn't. Um, so th this, was a pretty, um, this was a pretty stormy day. It's, it's hard to imagine this, but there was a lot of rock and roll going on there. And then we started seeing icebergs when we got close to Antarctica. And the icebergs were really, um, incredibly fascinating to watch. Now, because Antarctica has months of total darkness, right? Right now it's summertime down there. So it's like this scenario over here. But in the winter months, when there's total darkness, seawater freezes and it forms sea ice all the way around the continent. And then that, that sea ice breaks up and melts in the summer months and it opens up. And this is the, where we went into. But because the drill ship, the Joides Resolution, does not have an ice strengthened hull. We needed an icebreaker to lead us in. So the um, Nathaniel B. Palmer uh, escorted us in. It turns out we we didn't encounter an awful lot of sea ice, but it's still we, there's no way they would have allowed us to go down there without having an escort. Um, just to make sure that we could um, we could get through there. So that was this is looking back on the drill ship. So this is the Joides resolution and the Derrick here. It's just like the same technology we use for drilling for oil and gas. As a matter of fact, when the ship was built in 1978, it was built for oil and gas, and then it was sold um, for science and 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 uh, converted over for science. But this is 200 foot tall. And back in the day, back in the day, we used to be able to climb this ladder right here up to the top. It was so cool. But they, they, no, they, they stopped letting us do that. So did you take some, some of those pictures from that tower? Well, not on this expedition. We weren't allowed to. But years ago, when I was younger, it was probably a lot easier for me to climb, climb it, too. And the safety, for sure. So as the as the pack ice, as the seasonal sea ice is breaking up, we noticed um, we started uh, encountering penguins, and these are a daily penguins. They, they stand about yay high. And uh, when I was uh, uh, when I went to Antarctica when I was younger, uh, me and another grad student made up this reason why we needed to go up to a penguin rookery 
to do some geology up there. So the two of us grad students spent the whole day on a, a daily penguin rookery. This is about 30 or 40,000 birds. And they're totally unafraid of us. Um, and they were so cool. They, they, they'd come right up to you. Pretty amazing. But we, we, we saw wherever there's ice, there would be um, penguins hanging out. And you know penguins are good eating, right? Leopard seals love them. <laughs> that one on the left looks like he just got done devouring him, chomping down. Seriously, yeah. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, that's what they're out there um, doing. The, uh, the, the penguins are out there feeding and those guys, this uh, one of my shipboard colleagues took this picture. It's a nice shot of these. these they're just amazing birds, you know, think about it. So the, the ice, the ice is really beautiful. And the icebergs were really fascinating. And we saw a lot of them. Little ones to huge ones. Um, I don't know why this got cut off, but that tabular berg right there, um, the front of it's like 100 to 160 feet above sea level. So you can imagine there's a lot of it below. It, it capped off the Ross Ice Shelf and the average thickness of the Ross Ice Shelf is 1300 feet. So you can imagine a lot of that thing is below. And this is just a telephoto, a, a little bit zoom in of this end of the thing. It's really impressive as it drifted by. But we got, we got pretty close to these things. And the, the icebreaker wasn't with us at the time. It's just we, they, the mates were definitely watching carefully for ice because it was everywhere around us. Uh-oh. And some beautiful just pictures in the Ross Sea. It was just gorgeous. But some days it was like this. And one of the technicians on, the, on board had a drone and it almost looks like it's a model in a, in a kid toy in the tub, but that's in the Ross Sea, super calm. And then with the ship, so the thing about the drill ship is that it has thrusters, it has motors all the way around it. It's got the main screws in the back to drive it forward, but it's got these other electric motors. And when we arrive on site, um, the ship has the ability, it stays in place. And we'll, we'll stay there for days or weeks or however long we need to be there to drill into the seafloor below. But when we're sitting there stationary, seals started showing up. And we got lots of seals um, around the boat. It was really fascinating to watch these guys. They, yeah, there were all kinds of colors. White to gray to brownish. But I, I swear they look like dogs, you know, when you see them. We, we did see some whales. I don't know what kind that is. And a pod of, uh, this is orca off in the distance. There's a whole bunch of them out there in this view. Sometimes we got uh, snow down there. And this is, it was snowing like crazy. So everybody ran out of the lab to go get a picture. But, you know, the weather, um, it, was rarely like this, but sometimes it was. So I'll use this real quick to, to point out a couple of things. So the front end of the ship right here, this is the hotel. So this, this is where uh, the quarters are. Um, the, the bridge is right here. Um, the science staff is here and it's about seven stories. I think super high tech amount of stuff on there. The drill floor, all the drill pipe is stored right back here. Uh, the, Helideck right in here. And this is what's called the catwalk. So what happens is um, it's a it's a big steel pipe, hollow. But what goes down the center of it is a core barrel. And the core barrel is 10 meters long, so 30 feet. And inside the core barrel is a plastic liner. So what happens is we drill ahead 10 meters at a time. We stop. They, they decouple the, the pipe and send out a wire line and go grab the core barrel and bring it up to the surface, lay it down, you know, 10 meters long, and then they pull out the plastic core liner 
and hand it off to us, the scientists. And then the drillers reconnect the pipe, you know, they throw another core brittle down and they advance another 10 meters at a time. So that allows us to ship the stationary and allows us just keep advancing 10 meters at a time as we, as we advance into the seafloor. It's really amazing technology. Here's the, the, the uh, drill floor. So here's the drill pipe right here. It's not connected to the rest of it. Um, they must have just pulled the core or something. But the, but the rest of the drill pipe is just hanging there, hanging there in the seafloor um, um, below. And here's where they're just, um, th this is a joint uh, where, the, uh, where two pipes are screwed together. And, and the, uh, the pipes are lifted up into the tower and then lowered down um, through the drill floor. And right below the drill floor is this big open area called the moon pool. Show me some pictures of the moon. Now, what is that white there? Snow. <laughs> we did get a little snow in Antarctica. Yeah. Um, not a lot of it, but, but some. So this is the moon pool. So right above this, this shot right here is the drill floor that I just showed you. And this is the drill pipe going down to the sea. And normally there's doors uh, um, that are closed. They don't leave this thing open unless they're deploying something through there. And then here's a couple of the, the marine technicians with this core liner filled with sediment. So it takes a whole pile of people because it's, it's 30 feet long. It's, it's kind of wobbly, but it's filled with mud. And then what they do is they lay it out on, on the catwalk here so out there, you know, so 30 feet long. Um, they, they put these end caps on and they cut it into one and a half meter sections and bring it into the labs. And that's, we, we end up using, we end up working when, with one and a half meter sections. Every week, uh, without fail, we have a boat drill. You know, they're making sure that, you know, everybody knows what to do in case there's an emergency. Um, this is one of the scientists uh, scraping the core. So they, they take like a glass blade or something just to um, make the cores nice and smooth. So, so it's easier to describe them. Um, here's yours truly uh, preparing samples in the lab. Um, in, the, in the labs, we've got monitors. So if we do a re-entry or if they lower something through the moon pool and down to the seafloor, we can watch it on TV. This is our uh, science meeting room um, where, we, where we meet. Here, here's a button. So this is a core that was taken. Each of these is a one and a half meter section, uh, all laid out and sedimentologists um, get around, uh, work around this. And there's a lot of active debate um, and discussion going on as they describe the cores. And this guy right here, um, Dave Harwood from University of Nebraska, um, he's one of the world's experts on those diatoms. And just some of the other labs, this is all of us right here. We were all the paleontologists, the micropaleontologists on this, on this cruise. And some other, just the lab is just teamed, teeming with all kinds of stuff going on. So sometimes um, they, they need to go down to the seafloor to re-enter a cone or just to see what's going on in the, on the seafloor. So they send down a camera sled. So the camera sled just gets attached to the steel pipe and it gets lowered from a winch. It just slides down the pipe and then we can watch what's going on. So this is the, this is the drill string. You can see the, the drill bit down here at the end of it. I can get this thing to work again, here we go, with a squid going by. But that's, there's the drill pipe and the drill bit is down here at the, at the end. And here's a, right when we're right at the seafloor and you see how rocky it is. So this is, it's rocky because of all the icebergs, right? It's carrying what's called ice rafted debris and it, it just drops its load down here. And when we're in the upper part of the sediments and they're still mostly soft, we do what's called um, hydraulic piston cores. And so what happens is they shoot a piston into the seafloor for 10 meters. And this is a video, if it works, that shows, so it's right above the seafloor. And what they're gonna do is gonna shoot the piston into the seafloor. Let's see if this is gonna work. 
So it's like, wham, just real under high um, uh, water pressure. It's just pumped into the seafloor, and you see, you'll, you'll see there's a the the core barrel was hanging out below. That's what was just um, jammed into the into the seabed. Most of the time, it was too rocky. We couldn't use the hydraulic piston core because of that. The technology on the ship has changed so much over the years. Um, I could do video calls, like Zoom calls back home. And my daughter teaches uh, middle school science. I had, a, I had a ship to shore video call with her class. And that was just a cartoon I drew up on the whiteboard as I was talking to the kids. You know, I did a tour all around the ship and just told them what we were doing. I was trying to <laughs> show them what we were doing. Okay, so we went down to Antarctica to, 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 to study about climate change and the oceanography. So some of our objectives, and this is all the detail we're gonna get into. I'll just mention these real quick. So we're gonna reconstruct proximal means we're studying Antarctica. Instead of studying the deep sea out, out here, away from the continent, we're studying next to the continent where the ice is um, to look at past what's called polar amplification and various climate feedbacks that might be associated with that. We needed to um, assess the role of the ocean, um, like sea level and temperature on the stability of the ice sheet, because sometimes the ice sheet advanced out across the shelf and then it retreated at other times, right? It's really dynamic system. We've got all kinds of water masses that interact out here in the Southern Ocean with the Ross Sea and this red water mass in particular, it's a warm water mass and it's now starting to affect the fringes of Antarctica. And we wanted to try to understand these water masses better. We wanted to evaluate the contribution of the West Antarctica to ice volume and sea level estimates. Remember, I was, I was saying, it's the West Antarctic ice sheet that's vulnerable. Um, not the East, the big East Antarctic ice sheet, because this is what happens to the, um, to the West Antarctic ice sheet. Much of the West Antarctic ice sheet is actually below the sea level. It's in a deep basin and there's ice. And the problem with rising sea level and warm waters coming in from below, you can get in and attack the ice from below. And it makes it super vulnerable. This is the, this area plus Greenland is our greatest concern in the coming decades with regards to uh, immediate, if not tipping point kinds of consequences with, with, uh, with, with rising sea level. Because the, the, the thing is, What's shown, what's shown here with these, with these colors, these are yellow and green sediments. The yellow are diatom oozes, which means if it's, if it's pure diatom rain on the seafloor, that means it's all open ice. I'm sorry, open water. The ice is gone. The green and gray correspond when there is ice around. The problem is we've, we've drilled lots of examples where Antarctica, became deglaciated, not all of Antarctica, but in the, in, the, in the Ross Sea during these warm periods. And then, it's all this glacial, the slope in the continental rise. Sites with the open circles right here. And I studied this one for my master's thesis right here, but it had been 50 years since we had been back to Antarctica to drill on the on the, on the continental shelf. And this is just a profile across the shelf 
So here's the Transantarctic Mountains. And these are the sites, um, the new sites that we drilled plus the old ones. And we always had to bear in mind that these sites, the shelf has been multiply, multiple times glacier with big ice. And big ice is heavy and it depresses the sediments and the crust underneath it. And that's the continental shelf of Antarctica is really, um, is really um, deep because of, it's been loaded by ice. The thing is with ice going back and forth, it leaves behind really distinctive sediments. So close to the grounding line where the ice is, is in contact with the seafloor, um, you get these poorly sorted sediments. Out here across the shelf, underneath the ice shelf, um, you get size sorted by currents. And then out here in the open ocean, this is where you get more and more of the microfossils showing up, um, these open water sediments. So the, the comings and goings of the ice affect the sediments. And then we've got climate change and water masses that are affecting um, the seafloor and the organisms that we study. Like the, the, the forams that I study are very, very sensitive to this. One of the ways we know where to drill is we do um, we use geophysics. We use sound energy, what are basically sound waves to penetrate um, into the seafloor and then on different layers of sediments, the sound energy comes back to the surface. It's picked up by hydrophones and it allows us to image the seafloor. So these are just two of the sites that we drilled. And this is showing the layers of sediments and the interpretations of those, of those lines there. So that's how we characterize um, the drill sites before we drill them. Just like this picture, I think I showed that before. And then we use um, biostratigraphy. So in other words, the microfossils and paleomagnetism to, to create, to understand the age of the sediments. So what's shown here, these are the five sites that we drilled. This is time from the present day back to about 20 million. So that's how far back in time we got. The colors here represent the sediments that we actually cored. These gaps right here, represent breaks in the, in the record. These are unconformities caused by the ice going across the ice shelf, eroding sediments, retreating, sediments accumulate, the ice sheet comes back multiple times. And these are very widespread unconformities. And the biostratigraphy allows us to date those sediments. Now, this is a super complicated diagram, but it's, it's, it's showing Paleomagnetism. So our compass today points north, right? 780,000 years ago, our same compass standing in the same place pointed south. Right? That 780,000 years ago is right there. So today we're in what's called normal polarity. But our Earth's magnetic field has, has done reversals episodically throughout Earth history. And that's what the black and white stripes represent. It looks like a, um, a barcode. Thank you. We don't use barcodes anymore, do we? They're the other the barcode. Yeah. Anyway, this barcode right here is really, really distinctive. And we can date that um, when these reversals happen. And then we compare that with first and last occurrences of different microfossils. Here's the diatoms, radiolarians dinoflagellates and the plankton foraminifera that I study. So these, you can't see them, but these are tops and bottoms of species. And so that's how we were able to put age on the cores. So here's, here's one example. Here's one of our drill sites, back to about 160 meters of section. These are first and last occurrences of fossils. Plus there's a couple of paleomag tie points in here. Which are the crosses? There's only two. There's only two good paleomag points in here. One's right there, and the other one's right there. But what it's showing is, if, if you if you do best fit lines through this, what it's showing is the squiggly the lines represent where there's unconformities. So in other words, from about two million years ago to about eight million years ago, there's no record. There's a there's eight million years missing right there, and then. 
This, because there's a slope to it, that's the rate that the sediment accumulated, the rate of sedimentation. So the bugs, the microfossils, are super powerful to put together a story of how these sediments accumulated. And then the sediments themselves, like I said, have, to, have shown us multiple evidence where the West Antarctic ice sheet has, has at times collapsed, right? At glacial maximum, it looks like this, right? But when it gets warm down in the Ross Sea or elsewhere in the world, this is where it's vulnerable. And the, and, and the Ross Sea is open and it accumulates diatoms only. But when there's ice around, either an ice shelf or a granite ice sheet, then we, then we get different kinds of sediments. And so anyway, that, that's the, the main thing we were going down to Antarctica to do was try to better understand the Antarctic record of the last 25 million years and how Antarctica responded to um, warming in the past. So we got lots of, here's my microfossils. These are pictures that I took on the ship. The diatoms were the all important ones. That's these critters right here for telling us about age. This is what they, what they look like. Sometimes these delicate structures are beautifully preserved, but mostly not moderate to poor pres preservation. The, the fossils just, with all that ice going back and forth, they get really, really beat up. And it's rare to have well-preserved uh, fossils. These are some silicious radiolarians. And then we also have organic walled fossils called dinoflagellates, but also pollen and spores. So these would be coming from Antarctica from times in the past when there was forests on Antarctica. And there was, so you know. Can you tell what, what plants? Yes, are? absolutely. Yep, and we had, on the ship, we had two palynologists with us, experts on, that study for uh, spores and pollen and dinoflagellates. Yeah, and, and the thing is, this is really, really important because way back in Antarctica, um, where it's now glaciated, there used to be marine basins, and those marine basins have preserved in them fossils from the distant past of Antarctic's history. And these uh, ice has reworked these fossils out onto the shelf. So we're always looking for evidence for reworked fossils. And the critters that I study, if we, if we study their distributions, it, they're giving us clues about the water masses that are affecting the, are affecting the, the Ross Sea. And here's just, some pictures of, of some of the critters um, that I found on the ship. Not only forams, the top row, these are all the microfossils that I study. These are ostracods. These are little arthropods. Like They're like crustaceans. These are echinoderms, echinoderm spines, and sponge in here. So there's, there's lots of different kinds of critters. Sometimes the fossils are, are poorly preserved, and sometimes they're well-preserved. And I even got some planktic foraminifera sometimes, these floating types of, of critters. But basically what we're trying to do here is relate the Antarctic record close to where the ice sheets are with the deep sea record that I, was, I showed you a little bit earlier. This is all generated from you know, deep sea benthic foraminifera. So we're trying to relate this composite record to what we see actually up on the up on the up on the continent. Okay, I got I got one more piece. You guys are up for it. One more piece of the story. Okay. A, you got any questions? So it's about yes, three questions. Q and A. Oh, Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. Couple times when I I'm teaching, I I totally don't see that. We can hear you. We can hear you. And what's the last one? Audio keeps cutting in and out. Oh, cool. okay. I wonder if it's because I think it's only because I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. I'm wandering too much. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm I'm probably moving away from the speaker too much. Okay. So. I have a question. Yep. Uh, you said that the not unconformities over the last twenty million years, and you mentioned one unconformity from. Two million years ago to eight million years ago, 
So does that mean that glaciation in regionally in Antarctica was occurring similarly to what was happening in North America? Uh, yes, I mean, the, and do we know the cycle? Yeah, so the, the glacial interglacial cycles are driven by orbital forcing. So the axial tilt, the shape of our orbit around the sun, and what's called precession, which is um, how Earth, um, it's the time of the year that we're closest to the sun. You may not realize it, but we're actually closest to the sun in early January by 5 million kilometers closer in January. We're further from the sun in July. So proximity to the sun has no, is no explanation at all for anything to do with global warming or anything. It's, it's precession of the seasons. But anyway, those three periodicities, 21,000, 41,000, 100,000 years are the things that, that greatly govern uh, the climate system on the, on the planet because it affects incoming solar radiation, which affects evaporation and precipitation. And the same cycles that drive Northern hemisphere ice sheets, glacial interglacial cycles are also driving them down in the Southern hemisphere. And the places that have like a 6 million year gap is because they've been stripped multiple times. They just, they might've had sediments there before, but maybe the last glaciation you know, stripped out a whole bunch more. And so we have to piece together as many records as we can to come up with a composite story. And we, we know, we, we know we're, we're battling unconformities when you're, when you're close to the ice sheet, but the presence of an unconformity is also information. It's all, if we can date it, right? If we can date how much time is missing. I can't read that. January 2000 what? It's this year. I'm pretty sure it's this year. This, uh, this uh, in the news, Friday, September something, 2022. So in the, in the news this fall, I saw for the very first time that I remember in the media talking about the wor word tipping points. And I think it's really important that it, it, it get out there because a tipping point is how the climate system works, right? Often some of the biggest, most rapid um, climate change that, that we have from the geologic past is, is this, this whole idea, you push, push, push until all of a sudden you exceed whatever that resistance is and then you got a new system. And this is one of the, one of the issues. I mean, we're starting to see, um, you know, big breakups big fracturing in some of the large ice shelves. And the ice shelves are really super important because they buttress the land-based ice. That's gonna be the, what's gonna cause sea level to rise. This is from 1962 Life Magazine. Look at this headline. Each day, Humboldt supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. I don't think they'd be saying that now. I mean, pretty, pretty funny um, to think about it. So how many of you have seen this data plot before? This is CO2 um, in our atmosphere as measured at Mauna Loa since 1958. And what's important about 1958, it was called the International Geophysical Year. And experiments were set up around our planet to establish a baseline essentially of Earth. And as a matter of fact, my advisor, Peter Webb, who was a New Zealander, you know, the guy I went to Antarctica with in the 70s, he was a graduate student in the IGY, and he and his buddy, fellow graduate student, were the first people into the dry valleys of Antarctica in 1958. It's kind of cool that, that um, but so the data starts in, in 1958, this is just a blow up of the last five years. By the way, I downloaded this just last month in December, but you can go to this website and consider this. And like with my classes, I ask them to consider these questions. First of all, why does the PCO2 curve show these regular wiggles? Yeah, the what? Winter versus summer. Winter versus summer. Basically outside right now, 
we have nobody's taken in CO2. So in the wintertime, CO2 accumulates in the, in the northern hemisphere. But in the summer, when the plants come out, CO2 drops. So this is just, this is just um, um, winter, summer, winter, summer. So it's, it's the actual natural lungs of our earth, you know, taking in and, and breathing out uh, CO2, the lungs of earth. So, you know, what's the level of, of PCO2 today? It's almost 420. You know, what was it when you were born, your parents were born? I'm off the map too. And, you know, the thing is, is um, anyway, but that's, 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 that's what it is. And then I ask him about, has CO2 been increasing at a constant rate based on this instrument record? And the answer is no, because if you just look at the steepness of these lines, notice it's getting steeper and steeper, right? Still, after all these years talking about it, it's still, uh, it's, it's increasing. And so the thing is, um, I mean, we really have to ask the question, right? When is it going to peak, right? Because th this is across the bottom. You see, this is this is from our last, our previous glacial, right? At about 150,000. There's our last interglacial, our last glacial at 20,000 years ago and today. And this is temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere. So <laughs> it's just current. This, you know, this this figure gets out of date every every year. But remember, we looked at the, the plot of data right from the Vostok ice core. The natural range of variability in our atmosphere is 180-280. That's, that's what this blue represents here. This is 180-280, 180-280. And now we're like at, at 420. And you know, with the prospects of, you know, we're gonna knock on the door of 800 you know, by the end of the century, if we're not careful, right? Human activity has unequivocally altered the composition of our atmosphere. And the, th the, th the thing is, the headlines that, that are coming out, so science, it seems so counterintuitive, but science is extremely conservative. And it took decades before the scientific community has finally agreed that it's been human activity is the reason why CO2 has gone up. And the the problem is we, we have to take action or else we're gonna lose most if not all of Greenland and, and West Antarctica. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, so here's a couple of headlines. This is from Science Magazine in, in March of 2015. Antarctica is rapidly losing its edge because of this, um, the increasing loss of the ice shelves. This was just from this past summer showing the Antarctic ice shelf crumbling faster than, than thought. This is the source of those big icebergs that I showed you that we drove by down in the down in the in the in the Ross Sea. Um, and the thing is, it's the ice shelves that buttress the continental ice sheet. And it's the continental ice that's going to contribute to, to, to sea level rise. So the ice streams are shown in the red. So in the Ross Sea down here, and here's the Ross ice shelf, but all these red things. That's the East Antarctic and West Antarctic ice sheets contributing to the Ross ice shelf. Up here in the Weddell Sea, this is, this is um, buttressed by another large floating ice shelf. But the, the Ross ice shelf is the, is, the, is the largest of these. And new data here, um, this is just from a couple of years ago, showing uh, off of West Antarctica here, sea surface temperatures are warming. And these areas in red, these are this is part of the ice sheet that is losing mass. Um, it's it's thinning, and even parts of the Ross ice shelf are thinning, shown here in in red. So it's the thing is we're we're starting to see even down in Antarctica the, the first evidence for um, uh, more increasing rate of melting. And part of the reason is we got these warm circumpolar waters come into the underside. And this is where, this is the ice shelf, right? This is the, this is the part that buttresses the, the ice back here on the continent, this buttress right here. And it's the warming from below. And like I said, the West Antarctic ice sheet is also below sea level. So as sea level, global sea level goes up and warming, it's just gonna, it's easier for the West Antarctic ice sheet to lift off the base. And that, that can cause 
you know, the, the, the increases in, in, uh, in, in CO2. So what geoscientists do, what, what, what gets me excited, you know, in, in decades of research is studying our, our climate past, right? And there's a couple scales of data shown here. So um, I keep losing my pointer here. So right here, here's the ice core data that we looked at before, the 180 to 280 record right here in thousands of years. But if we go back in time to millions of years, the Pliocene, the late Pliocene here was the last time we know that the earth had 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. This middle Miocene climatic optimum, that was one of our objectives for drilling in the Ross Sea. Um, um, it, it was much warmer than it is today. And if we go back to the Eocene, we're, we're back into temperatures that are above the time when Antarctica had an ice sheet. And this, this right here, this is the modeled um, level of when Antarctica potentially could deglaciate this level of PCO2. But 800 is, is what some climate models looking to the, to the future here. It's like, which of these cases is humanity gonna follow? How much is temperature, global temperature gonna rise by 2100? And to me, and I, I, I tell this to class, what, matter, what matters to me are you know, my grandkids. Right, they are going to live to see twenty one hundred, right? And whenever you know, it's just we we have to take this serious because it's really it's really happening. Um, eastern seaboard of the United States, right, present day uh, shoreline. This blue line right here is the last glacial maximum twenty thousand years ago. That's where the sea level was. Sea level fell by 125 meters, right? When we build up all this Northern hemisphere ice. So all the Georges bank, all this area off of Jersey, this was all above land. But this dark green, that's the Pliocene. That's the last time, um, the last time that PCO2 in the atmosphere was 400 and, and sea level was maybe as much as 20 or 25 meters higher than it is today. This is why a lot of my climate change colleagues are studying the Pliocene is to understand, is this where we're going right today? That would be catastrophic. I mean, Florida would be under underwater. And it, ter it turns out this, this is where some of the most densely populated places, not only in the United States, but in the world are, you know, near the, near the, near the coast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, anyway. So this is 500 million years of Earth history. And sea level is the story of our planet's history. Sea level has been up and down all over the place. And so down here on the on left hand side is just showing the, the, the extent from the of the last ice age. So this is today at zero. We were 125 meters lower during the last glacial maximum. So that, that's the glacial interglacial variability. But if we go at, when the dinosaurs were around in the Cretaceous, sea level was much higher. And if we go back into the Paleozoic time, sea level was much higher. Just to show you as an example, this is Ordovician time. And I grew up in the Midwest collecting fossils because all this light blue stuff, this was all shallow marine. You know, when I was a kid, man, I you could go find fossils everywhere because global sea level was a lot higher. In the Cretaceous, where the present day Rocky Mountains are, right, 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado, this, is, this was a big seaway that went from the, uh, from the Arctic down to the Gulf of Mexico. The last time global sea level was, was this high. So, Sea level is part of Earth history, but the, the thing is, it's the rate at which sea level is changing which is the most alarming. And back to this idea about what a tipping point is, you know, Earth can be in a kind of stable state where it, it oscillates back and forth, like even on glacial interglacial timescales, 
But the thing that we got to avoid is getting to some critical tipping point where we're going to cascade into a brand new um, climate dynamic. And that's, that's kind of what, what, what's shown right here. Um, back in time, looking down the diagram. So here's the glacial interglacial cycles. But now we're up into this, what we call the um, uh, Anthropocene, right? This time that we're living in now, affected by humankind. Are we going to allow our planet to maintain some stabilized situation? Or are we going to get to the point where we lose Greenland and West Antarctica within decades, right? Very fast. And th then, you know, it's a, it's a runaway, it's a, it's a runaway train. And I saw this article um, a couple of years ago about being optimistic. Have you guys ever heard of this S-curve before? The idea about technology, how we adapt to changes in technology. So the idea that the curve here is, it's got this S shape to it, right? So it's an emerging technology, rapid growth, and the maturity of this technology. And here's some examples. Electricity is from 1900, 1930, you see radio, color TV, computer, internet. So if growing at 40 to 50% a year, once we hit 2% in this growth stage right here, then, you know, it, it doubles every year. It's, 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 it's cause for optimism. If you ask me, here's, here's, a, here's, here's a bunch more. So for, for example, if you, if you look at back at electricity and telephone and early on here, the, the slow, sorry, this thing is gonna wear my thumb out. The, the slope is really stretched out here, but look at the more recent technologies like the internet, VCR, microwave, computer, look at cell phone, it's almost vertical, right? The fact that all of us have been able to adapt to cell phone technology so quickly, um, you know, why can't we do the same thing for green technologies? We're gonna have to, right? What, what it comes down to, but we, but we just have to convince everybody that we, it has to be a priority. This is, this is not a bunch of liberal gobbledygook about what's going on in science. Uh, science is really tough business. And um, the data are so clear. But quick, quick anecdote. My father-in-law, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, lived in Chicago his whole life. He loved reading the newspaper, but he was a tradesman. But so he, he wasn't a scientist or anything, but he'd read the paper. And for decades, he and I would debate climate change. He was a massive climate change denier, but he loved talking with me about it. I'd bring out my best PowerPoint slides. I think they were my best. I could never convince him. You know why? Because to him in Chicago, it's hot and humid in the summer, and it's cold and windy in the winter. And it's been the same ever since he was a kid. But if, if you talk to the farmers in Northern Illinois, they will tell you a very different story about their experiences, about the, the changing condition. It's just, we, we just have to get over the, the thresholds to, to, to make things happen faster. It's just, we have to. There's a, a cartoon that I've got in my refrigerator at home. Two friends, one guy's covered in smell, he's digging, he says, the climate change is real, what's, what's all this smell all about? And then there's a polar bear in the next one standing on a tiny little piece of ice saying, first, I'm going to explain the difference between weather and climate to him, then I'm going to <laughs> I love it. Lynn, I'd love to see a copy of that one. Yeah. So I did a little thing here on numbers tonight. And, and what, what I did was, you know, a little five-minute lecture on slide chart, um, based upon something that we had to find out. Um, the the yeah. the uh, plant growth zones yeah the hardiness hardiness zones they're moving at a rate of nine feet per day nine feet per day yeah so like the like the sugar maples yeah you know going north and yeah and so the thing is unless and unless unless it affects you directly. Right, we're not gonna we're not gonna make we're, we're not gonna make headway. Right, yeah. 
I don't want to interrupt you, but you mentioned your daughter teaching science. Right. Uh, not, 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 uh, not enough. Not enough. Let me, and uh, two quick things, then I want to take some questions. So one of the co-chief scientists, this was his birthday, and we decided to go out on deck and celebrate a little beach party out on the, we call that Steel Beach. Um, so, and then I had to leave you with two pictures from my backyard. So uh, that black bear um, cub, I swear it was only a cub. And then this uh, art owl right out in my, you know, from my back porch in Belchtown. So I just thought, you know, I'll come into a, a bird of nature club. I got to share some <laughs> bird of nature from my back. All right. Happy to take any questions. Yeah. For people online, they can put them in Q&A or put them in chat. I know that. So just, just I, I know for that people was on, for people online, if you want to put your question, type them into the Q&A or put them in the chat room. Now, those pictures that you did, um, that you showed your vote and your vote, right? Um, yep. When was that? What was 2018. 2018. Now, and you've also been there in the 70s? Yes, late 70s. What? So what, you know, with your eyes, did you, did you notice an adjustment? So when I was there 